This staple is critical. If it had been placed over here or over here, the trap wouldn't work. So again, this is not an example of anything like a Darwinian process. This is an example of intelligent design. As a matter of fact, this trap uh, should not even be considered some sort of uh, improvement on this. This is a completely different trap that was made by John, uh, John McDonald. Um, so let's ask ourselves, who put, you know, where did these, these uh, staples come from and who decided uh, or what decided where they should go? Well, apparently they came from heaven because uh, John McDonald doesn't address them. But Darwinists cannot, you know, either implicitly or explicitly invoke angels uh, on their, on their, uh, in their uh, schemes because the angels are on our side. That's a joke. <laughs> joke, joke, it's a joke. Okay, uh, one more example of his trap. This is step three to step four. He says he's adding the, the hold down bar. But notice that the hammer here is now a completely different hammer up here. It's got a couple of extra sections and it's uh, bent in a different shape. Uh, and uh, that is not justified in, in Darwinian terms. Uh, furthermore, he adds the hold down bar and he adds another piece, a staple, to hold down the hold down bar. Notice that the hold down bar is not just a piece of metal, it's got a little curl at the end. That curl is critical. If that curl wasn't there, the whole trap would be broken. So again, this is not an example of anything like a Darwinian process. It's an, uh, it's an example of intelligent uh, construction. Nonetheless, a lot of people think that this somehow uh, relates to Darwinian evolution. And one person is a man named Peter Atkins, who's a uh, well-known scientist, textbook author. And he wrote in his review in inf on the Infidel's uh, website, uh, he cites McDonald's trap uh, approvingly, and he says that it shows that I have uh, limited powers of imagination in seeing how such things could be put together. The implication being that if you believe in Darwinian theory, you have unlimited powers of imagination. But there's a problem with having unlimited powers of imagination. Here's another person with unlimited powers of imagination. Whoop, not him. Oh, uh, that's again. Calvin. Calvin can imagine quite anything. He can hop in a box and, and fly wherever he wants. But science cannot work on, with unlimited imagination. It needs a disciplined imagination. <coughs> so another textbook author who uh, approves of the McDonald mousetrap example is Ken. And Ken uh, has used this example in talks he's given around the country, if, if I'm not mistaken, at least in one. And uh, he, nonetheless, he has heard my arguments against the mousetrap example, like I'm telling you here. And he has responded against them. He still thinks that the mousetrap example is a good one. And he's written uh, and posted on his website uh, the following reasons why he thinks it still is good. First, he says that Behe argues that McDonald's four simpler mouse traps do not present a good model of a Darwinian process. Even the simplest trap, Behe argues, requires the involvement of intelligence. I agree. He agrees they involve intelligence. And if I or McDonald or anyone else had ever presented the simpler mouse traps as examples of an evolutionary transition, Behe would be right. Okay. So one asks, what's the point? What's the point of the, uh, the thing? And Ken writes that he thinks the point is this. If simpler versions of this mechanical device can be shown to work, then simpler versions of biochemical machines could work as well. And this means that complex biochemical machines could indeed have had functional precursors. So even though they were intelligently designed, somehow they have to do with Darwinian evolution. But I would submit that this statement uh, rides on an ambiguity in the word precursors. Does he mean physical or conceptual precursors? If he means conceptual precursors, that is things that kind of look alike, kind of do the same job, but need an intelligent agent to design them and manipulate them or, or some such thing, well, then we can talk. But if he means physical uh, precursors, then I think that is exactly wrong. The Mousetrap series shows exactly the opposite. It shows that even if you have a series of machines that look kind of like each other, that does not mean, or there's no reason to suppose from the mousetrap series that they could be transformed one into the other. And as a matter of fact, the mousetrap series shows that 
it would be very difficult to transform them one into the other, and perhaps uh, wouldn't be possible. So why do, do very smart people find the uh, mousetrap series persuasive? Well, uh, a couple reasons. The first, I think, is because it's dominated by a large platform and spring. So all the traps sort of kind of look like each other. The metal bars and staples look like insignificant details, but in fact, they're critical. Uh, another reason we don't have time to get into right now, but another interesting reason is what I call the clever Hans effect. Now, what is that? Well, clever Hans was a horse around the turn of the 20th century that seemed to be able to solve mathematical problems. His owner would say, Hans, how much is five plus five? Would stamp his hoof for 10 times, get a lump of sugar. Even if somebody who was not his owner, somebody from the crowd asked him a mathematical question, he seemed to be able to solve it. Well, by and by it was shown that the, even strangers would give kind of little twitches or, or tense up or something when the horse reached the correct number and the horse would then stop. The point that I want to make from this is that the intelligence of the person asking the question was attributed to the horse. But it was not the horse that was solving the problems, it, it was the person, it was the uh, intelligent agent. And in my experience, that's uniformly true with Darwinian stories that the intelligence of the, uh, of the person making up the story is attributed to natural selection, but it's actually the person solving the problem and not to natural selection. So in conclusion, I'd like to make a couple of points. First is that, I'm sorry, first is that there's a rhetorical asymmetry between Darwinism and people arguing against Darwinism. Darwinists want to convince you that evolution is easy. As a matter of fact, in their own minds, they think it is. So they have no motivation to point out difficulties. But you have to look at, at even the smallest details to, to uh, notice the difficulties for, for evolution. Uh, kind of the mirror image of that is that delving into difficulties takes time and, and, people, uh, and patience that many people won't want to spend. So it's difficult to, uh, to get the point across. And to, but to see the problems for Darwinism, you have to look at the most minute details. Otherwise, it looks very easy. If you don't look at the details, that mousetrap series of John McDonald's looks great. <laughs> now, the problem is that the details and the examples we really talk about are details of protein structure and, and other problems of biology. And if you don't have a background in there, you're going to uh, be missing a lot of it. And, and a lot of the Darwinian stories will sound plausible to you. Um, so, uh, if, if you think the McDonald mousetrap example is good, then you're certainly going to think that most Darwinian stories are good too. If you think there's something wrong with the, uh, the mousetrap example, and if you have the uh, necessary training, you will see that uh, virtually all of the stories that uh, are brought up have some of the same problems that afflict the mousetrap example. However, if you find something wrong with the uh, mousetrap example, but you don't, do not have the necessary training, uh, what do you do then? I would simply suggest that you keep in mind a, a, a skeptical question. If a simple mousetrap is so difficult to explain by Darwinian processes, why should we think that the much more complicated molecular machinery of the cell can be so explained? Keeping that in mind, I think, will breed a, breed, breed a healthy skepticism. Thanks very much.